question we were asked to talk about is how big is the food revolution? But I think in order for us to talk about how big it is, we need to define what it is. So for a lot of you people here at Seeds and Chips, you might think the food revolution started about five years ago when all the investment money and all the food startups started to happen. But it actually started a long time ago. And Evelyn brought up, it brought, actually started the, in the 19th century, but I'm going to talk about the 1950s and the 1960s. So after World War II, women started going to work, they were out of the house more, and foods that companies were producing tended to be more convenient. So some of the foods that came out in those two decades, I can't believe it's not butter. This is margarine. Personally, I can believe it's not butter because these are some of the ingredients. Another product that came out, Tang. I don't know if Tang was ever sold in countries other than the US, but it's a orange powdered, orange-like juice drink. And when I was young, you were cool if you drank this because the astronauts drank it when they were in space. But Tang, these are some of the ingredients in Tang. Now, if you notice, the first ingredient is sugar. Now, one of the things, if you haven't heard yet, that came out recently is that the sugar industry covered up research that showed that sugar is what contributes to heart disease, not saturated fat, like we've been told for so many years. And the other thing I find interesting, yellow five and yellow six is an artificial color, but there's artificial color and five and six, so what is that artificial color? Now, the scariest thing to me is BHA. It's another ingredient in Tang. It stands for butylated hydroxynanosol. So I can't pronounce it, but I can't believe that that is good for you. The United States Food and Drug Administration says that it's generally recognized as safe, but the National Institute of Health considers BHA a reasonably anticipated human carcinogen, which doesn't sound very good. So next, Cool Whip. Don't know if Cool Whip made it outside the States, but it's fake whipped cream. It includes trans fats and these other lovely ingredients. So a couple other products that were being sold to consumers, Pam. Pam is cooking oil in a can. It's canola oil, but it also has propellant and dimethyl polysiloxane added to it. Also, Pop-Tarts, Diet Pepsi, Pringles, the potato-like chip, came out then, as well as Sweet and Low, and my favorite, Swanson Frozen TV dinners. In the 60s, I was actually fed this as a child. We didn't have it often. My parents actually had a garden. We did eat pretty well. But this, every now and then, was a treat that we were given. And the difference between what you're looking at and what people actually ate is they actually came in aluminum or aluminum trays. So the food actually tasted like tin if you tasted anything. And honestly, it tasted just as good as it looks. So this might have been convenient, but I can't say it really tasted that well. So I think you get the point. People started being sold foods that had ingredients like this. Now, the unfortunate thing is that even today, these products are still sold, and people are still eating these ingredients. So from my perspective as a food advocate, I'm not surprised that people don't trust big food. And I know big food is changing, but this just explains why activists and advocates have taken some issue with them. So let's go to 1971. In 1971, Alice Waters opened her restaurant in Northern California, Chez Panny. She sourced all her ingredients locally. She used whole foods. She was one of the first, if not the first, local sustainable farm-to-table restaurants. In 1977, Anne-Marie Colbin founded the Natural Gourmet Institute. The Natural Gourmet Institute is the United States' oldest health-focused cooking school. And they are still around today with the same goal, which is to provide healthy food and to bring it back to our dinner tables. Now, also in the 1970s, agriculture policy in the United States changed. Very large subsidies were given to wheat, corn, and soy. Now, what that meant is that prices for those commodity crops went down, yields went up, and companies started to add them more and more to their foods. 
essentially, nutrition was discarded and replaced with company profit. So now we're at the early 1990s. There's a huge divide. We've got big food selling overprocessed, nutrient lacking food, selling meat from factory farms where animals were raised in inhumane conditions. But we also have the US government is starting to develop the national organic standards. So the movement toward fresh, healthier food has started. Fast forward to the 2000s, that's when the obesity epidemic got a lot of attention. According to the Harvard School of Public Health, in 1990, obese adults made up less than 15% of the US population. By 2010, 25% or more of residents in 36 US states were obese, and the UK and Australia were right in line with us. So here we've got the early 2000s. We've got factory farming, industrial food production, overprocessed food, nutrient-lacking food, and obesity epidemic. So this is when activists really started to organize nationally. This is when they started to push local, sustainable, and organic food into supermarkets, when they started to educate consumers and explain to them what was going on with the food system and what they could do about it. One thing that I think is often overlooked, why do millennials care about food so much? They did not pop out of their mother's womb saying, I care about food. They care about food because these activists for 30 plus years have put into the zeitgeist that we need to look at the issues around food and we need to do something about it. So the activists from 30 years ago are why millennials now care about food. So today, these activists, they're worried because so much work still needs to be done and the new food revolution hasn't been doing much. Consider this. How can we have a food revolution if we have no farmers? We hear about food tech, we hear about all this fancy stuff being done in containers, but what about farmers out in not just rural America, in developing countries where there is no tech? They're having a bigger issue than you realize. Farmers in the US, I don't know if this is a global statistic, but farmers in the US are in their late 50s. That data is a little old. They might be in their early 60s at this point. They are not encouraging their children to become farmers. So what are we gonna do if we have no farmers? How are we gonna have our meal delivery services? How are we gonna have um, our, all our products with healthy ingredients if we don't have farmers? Vertical farming and urban agriculture is definitely part of the solution, but it is not the whole solution. We have to start looking at the rural-urban divide and the fact that this new movement is not really thinking about people who are outside the bubbles. But my question to people at this conference is, how come we aren't investing money in converting farmland to organic? Why is so much money going into flashy, fancy food tech ideas. I mean, I know of a food company that was essentially a glorified CSA, an online CSA, which is community supported agriculture. They went out of business. They lost $26 million. Do you know what a group of farmers could do with $26 million? My biggest pet peeve is 3D ravioli, and I apologize because I know there are 3D food printing printed people here today, but how about we stop investing so much in 3D printed food and start investing in farmers around the world? Okay. I love Blue Apron, but how many more home delivery service cooking meal kits do we need? Every time I go online, there's a new one that's started. I mean, I think it's oversaturated. We already have the answers to our food problems. We just need to listen to the people who are already creating real change in their communities. They're creating real change from the ground up. It might not be as sexy as these fancy high-tech stuff, but there is change going on, successful, viable change. And, pe and these people are not getting the attention and the investment that they should be getting. How big is the food revolution? Well, after all this buildup, all I can say is, I don't know. Nobody knows. I can tell you this, it's much bigger than any of us realize. I've been a food advocate for almost 20 years now. And over the past couple of years, I've started mentoring startups. So I have a bit of a feel for both spaces. And what I have realized is that the food tech and food startup movement is not talking to the nonprofit food advocacy movement, and we need to. Think of how much better and how much bigger this food revolution would be if we collaborated and worked together. We need to connect and to collaborate 
and to work together. Because food problems are not just food problems. Food problems are family problems, educational problems, environmental problems, financial problems, and so much more. The 21st century, business is collaborative. There's a huge shift that's going on and has been going on. Greed and competition is so 20th century. And I've heard it several times throughout today. With millennials and the younger generation, there is a shift toward collaborative business. We need to work together. Though you think I might have been slagging off big food, I'm not. I'm, I'm pointing out what's happened. And what I'm suggesting is that we work together to find common solutions. Yes. We, we want to make a profit, yes, we want the businesses to be successful, but not at the expense of other people, and not through greed. Change Food is determined to make healthy, safe, delicious food available to everyone, everywhere on the planet. In the not too distant future, there will not be a food revolution. There will not be a food movement. We won't have to distinguish local, healthy, organic, sustainable. Because all that healthy, local, delicious food will just be called food. And I hope you will join us. Thank you.